But we want to take a moment to look at the four main ways people interpret this idea of a millennium. Like I said, this is one of the more technical uh, sermons we're going to do on on Revelation. But one of the things I I love about being a Baptist uh, is we have fought really hard. We came out of a tradition that means we value the freedom of conscience of each individual and we believe you have to take your own journey with Jesus And so I had somebody tell me, just tell me what to think about this. And I'm not going to tell you what to think about this. I'm going to tell you through church history what major leaders in the Christian church have thought about the millennium and you're going to have to work out with God. It is important to work to wrestle with the end of history and your view on it. But as I said, you're going to find out that some pretty significant people have had different views on this. So the first view uh, we'll look at is what uh, is termed the amillennial view. Now, just to introduce you to this diagram that I whipped up a little earlier, you'll see one of the assumptions in Revelation is that there is a heavenly realm where Jesus reigns with God the Father and where all the people who are praying, we see this picture of people praying to God, how long, how, that's where those that have gone before us are in the heavenly realm. At, on this side of eternity. Then uh, at the, you'll see that there is a, a time when Jesus comes back. There is a final judgment. And in the amillennial view, uh, actually in all the views, one of the things it's important to say is all the views end in the same place where there is an overlap of heaven and earth. And we, yeah, I'm, I can't wait till next week to share with you about the future we're looking forward to on the other side of Judgment Day. But we've got to get through Judgment Day first. And so this is the, the, the amillennial view would say that the, the, the 1,000 years is symbolic and started when Jesus bound Satan on the cross uh, and that the, the challenges we, the church has had since then are reflected in the challenges that are spoken about by Revelation. Uh, and we get that they would point to Revelation chapter 12, how the, the angel in Revelation chapter 12 binds and deals with Satan and casts him out of the heavens and takes his authority away because of what Jesus does on the cross. Uh, a lot of different people have thought this in terms of church history. Probably the, the man regarded as probably the greatest theologian in history, Augustine, held this view in his, uh, uh, in his work that the, the the, uh, oh, 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 I lost the book in my head. Anyway, he, 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 this incredible two-volume study of history he put together. Uh, but also, um, a couple of other names that probably will be familiar. Uh, you heard of Martin Luther, uh, John Calvin, the fathers of the Reformation would have ta- held an, an amillennial view. Okay? So that's the amillennial view. So, uh, some people believe, so we're going to look at the next view now, which is the post-millennial view. Some people believe that the millennium actually started after the temple's destruction in AD 70. So that, that's when the, the millennium started, when the temple was destroyed. It, it's impossible to overstate how big a deal it was for Jewish people that the temple was destroyed in AD 70. And that they would say that Jesus' reign on earth began then through the church and what will happen is that the world will get increasingly better and better and better because of the church in the world. Uh, The father of the Great Awakening in America, Jonathan Edwards, held this view and it was popular in the 1800s but it got reality checked. uh, Really, it it lost a lot of its steam in World War I as we realised this world's not getting a lot better. Uh, and so, so this is, that's the post-millennial view, that the millennium has started and that Jesus will come with the second coming and, and final judgment. Okay, so that, that's uh, post-millennial. Now, we have two versions of pre-millennialism. There is, uh, so this is the first version, this is what they would call, so pre-millennial, the pre-millennial understanding, this would be, would be called historic pre-millennialism, 
is this sense that uh, we are before the second coming, before the millennium, that Jesus is somehow going to come and begin a millennium reign on earth, that after which uh, the new heavens and the new earth will come. Uh, this, as I said, is sometimes called historic premillennialism. One of the early church fathers, Irenaeus, held this view. So did Justin Martyr, Charles Spurgeon would have held this view. And uh, a current uh, influencer in the Christian church, a man by the name of John Piper, would hold that view. It's sort of historic premillennialism. As I, I'm having to whip through all this, and, but I, I'm hoping it's kind of making sense. We, you see on the timelines, we're sort of placing us where we would be in these views. And this final view uh, would be the dispensational premillennialism, uh, where people expect the Christians to be taken up to heaven with a, a rapture. Now, they will disagree whether that is before during or after. So there's a pre-tribulation rapture some people believe in, some people believe in a mid-tribulation rapture and some people believe in a post-tribulation rapture. Uh, but it's sort of one or the other. And they would see that normally, and again, there's a whole right, with all these things, there's an oversimplification, you've got to hear this. It's an oversimplification, but they would, they would see that the rapture was going to last seven years, reflecting the seven bowls in Revelation uh, and that Jesus uh, would come at the end of that tribulation and the church would now be no longer on the planet and Jesus would come and be based in Jerusalem in a, and, and work through the Jewish people. Some people believe that the, the Old Testament feasts and everything will be reintroduced at that point, sort of going, going back to a, an Old Testament covenant. Uh, now, this way of seeing things was first named in the 1830s uh, by a man by the name of John Nelson Darby, who then went to America and communicated that to a, one of the great evangelists, D.L. Moody. Uh, it became the basis for the Schofield Bible, which was uh, one of the most common study Bibles uh, through the 20th century. Uh, Chuck Swindoll would hold this view, David Jeremiah would hold this view, and, and probably Billy Graham would have held this view of the end times. So you can see, one of the things I want to say, so I, as again, I, I'd love to have more time to unpack all this, but one of the things you can see is throughout the history of the church, people have seen this differently.